great truth to know that God's grace and goodness is always there when we are seeking it. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles tonight. I'm going to ask you to open it, if you would, please, to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Trust that you've had a good day. I had an opportunity this morning to speak to uh, both the elementary and the secondary uh, in their chapels today and uh, had a good time being able to present the, the word to them. And uh, I don't know, I, I may have to, uh, we sang a song in, in the elementary chapel today. I may have to sing that in the high school chapel tomorrow just to get them a little, boy, a little bit, you know, riled up a little bit. Uh, but I uh, enjoyed being able to speak to them uh, this morning, and uh, we're looking forward to doing that again tomorrow. And uh, one more night, and uh, appreciate your faithfulness to the meetings. Uh, appreciate those who have uh, been here, and uh, when you can, and you've been inviting folks and uh, appreciate the opportunity that we have to be able to serve and minister with you again. Tonight we're going to look at Colossians chapter 2. We're going to begin reading, uh, we're going to begin reading at verse 8, and we're going to read down through verse 12. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, the scripture reads this way, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead." As we begin the service tonight, I'm going to give you three names, and I wonder if any of these three names have any significance in your life. The first name that I'm going to give to you is the name Bonnie Loman. Second name is Johnny Gotch, and the third name is Ethan Katz. Now, for many of you, as you sit here tonight, if you were like me, I would say, you know, those names have very little, if any, significance. I don't even know if I had ever heard those names before. And to many of us, they are names that don't have much significance. But to some family members, to some friends, to people who grew up in their communities, they are people who had great significance. In fact, not only those three names, but over 700 other names were part of an important campaign that started in the early 1980s. Now, I am aware of the fact that in this room we have some people who were born well before 1980, but I also am very well of the fact that there are some in this room who were born well after 1980. And what I'm about to share with you may sound a little bit ridiculous, may seem uh, even some people, as I've mentioned this to them, they said, that's silly, that's stupid. But the campaign that I am talking to you, or that I'm going to explain to you, is a campaign that came up in the 1980s, and it was a campaign that was designed to help notify people of something that was taking place in our culture and our society that really began to scare and startle a number of parents. The campaign that was launched in 1980 was called the Missing Child Milk Carton Campaign. Some of you would remember those days where we had the milk cartons that were there, and on the back of those cartons, right next to the information about, you know, the, the different vitamins and things that were in it, how many calories and all of those, right next to that, there was a picture or two of some young people who had been abducted, kidnapped, or otherwise had come up missing. Information would be provided to these different milk uh, uh, companies, and as these uh, as these cartons were being printed and as they were being filled with milk, the idea was this, that as you would get up in the morning and you would have your cereal and milk and you'd be reading your paper, or if you were getting ready to go to bed at night or you were watching a game and you wanted to have a glass of milk and maybe some Oreo cookies or something like that, every time you pulled it out, there would be that reminder that there are these young people and even some adults who had been kidnapped, who had been abducted, or would otherwise come up missing. I don't know about you, but if you're a parent in this room, and uh, you would, uh, I, I guess if you're a parent in this room, you'd probably be like me in that you would have a fear, there is a little bit of a fear of that ever happening you know, with your own children. Uh, none of us would want that to happen in the lives of our own children. 
that campaign had two specific purposes. They said one purpose was this. It was to make people aware of the fact that these children were actually missing, and they were hoping that they would be able to see this, this picture, and someone would be able to provide information to help locate these children who had been abducted. The second reason for this, uh, for this milk carton campaign was to make people aware that these abductions were taking place so that parents would be on guard, they would be alert to the danger that this was taking place, and they would acknowledge that it could happen to them. So we come to this passage of Scripture in Colossians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul is writing to a group of believers that he loves, that he cares for greatly. And here in chapter 2, he presents to them a danger that he wants them to be aware of. And much like a parent would maybe look at their child and teach them some things like stranger danger. Don't get into a car with someone that you don't know. Don't talk to people that you don't know. Don't take candy from people that you don't know. And all of these things that we try to tell our children in efforts to protect them, the Apostle Paul is going to take his, his quill and his ink and his, his papyrus in hand, and he is going to write to these believers at Colossae, folks who he deeply cared for, and he said, I want to make you aware of a danger that you have to be aware of, not physically necessarily, but spiritually. And so I've entitled this message tonight in Colossians chapter 2, Avoiding Spiritual Abduction. You see, it's very possible tonight, and we're going to talk about this in just a minute, it's very possible that any one of us in this room could be spiritually abducted. And so what is the information that is given to us here in this passage of Scripture that is designed not only to inform us but to protect us as we seek to live this out so that we can be on guard and avoid spiritual abduction? Well, the first truth that is presented to us here in our text is this. He makes us aware, first of all, of the threat of spiritual abduction. Notice what he says there in verse 8. He says in verse 8, "'Beware.'" lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of this world, and, or after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. Notice the very first word in that verse. He says, beware. Now, I know this is probably going to be a little surprising to many of you tonight, but the word beware just simply means be aware. That's what that word means. And we often look at words like that, and we kind of skip over the meaning of that. But, but if you've ever seen a sign that has the word beware on it, you begin to recognize that, that there are some things that you are a little more alert to than you were before you saw that sign. For instance, you might come up to a place where there is some high-voltage electricity, and there would be a sign that says danger or beware, and it would tell you what that danger is. It's high-voltage electricity. I don't know about you, but I'm not real comfortable with, with being around thousands or even hundreds of thousands of volts of electricity. Uh, I don't mind playing around with a little bit of electricity in you know, our trailer or in a house or a building or something like that, but, but boy, you know, the electricity can be something that's dangerous, and so you have to beware of those dangers. Maybe a more common one that most of us are familiar with is a sign that says this, beware of dog. If you've ever walked up to a house where you've seen that sign, you begin to think automatically, I need to have my senses heightened because there is a danger that is around that before I saw that sign, I was not aware of. Reminds me of a story. When I was a youth pastor, we used to take our young people out, and we'd go on visitation. I'd divide them up into groups of two. I'd drop them off at a place, and I would take another group, drop them off, and, and uh, then I'd pick them up you know, after I was done, and we would have a meeting time, and then we would... Uh, finish the visitation time, we'd go get something to eat, and then we normally had our youth group meeting on Wednesday nights. Well, there was one Wednesday in the afternoon that we were having this visitation time, and one of the boys didn't have a partner to go with, and so I told him, I said, well, we'll, we'll be the last two to get out and uh, we decided we were going to go on visitation together. And as we were going on visitation, uh, we were, uh, oh, no, sorry, different, different story. Uh, I dropped these two boys off, and uh, they were going to go on visitation. I was still in the van. And uh, as, as I was coming around to pick these two boys up after I thought that they were done, I noticed that one of the boys had a paper towel on his hand, and it had a little bit of blood on it. And uh, when he got in the van, I asked him, I was like, what happened? You know, what, what, what happened while you were on visitation? Why are you bleeding? And so he started to tell me what happened. He said they went up to this house. They were going along the block, and they came up to this house. And on the fence, it said, beware of dog. 
Well, the gate was open, and, and they looked around. They didn't see, you know, any dog around. So they went inside this fence where they saw that sign, Beware of Dog. They got up to the door, and they knocked on the door. And when they knocked on the door, they heard this barking from a dog. And as soon as they heard that barking from the dog, they immediately began to run the, uh, down the sidewalk, try to get outside that gate and close the door as quickly as they could. Well, as he was running around that gate, there was a little bit of gravel on the sidewalk. And he, his feet went out from underneath him. He slipped. He fell. He skinned up his hand a little bit on the sidewalk. But they remained safe and away from the dog. Now, the funny thing about that story is this. I asked him, I said, so what kind of a dog is it? Is it a Rottweiler? Was it a Doberman Pinscher? Was it a German Shepherd? What kind of a dog was it? And they said, no, Pastor Shank, it wasn't anything like that. It was more like Naomi. You know, it was a, it was a real little dog. But, but because their senses were so heightened, as soon as they heard that dog barking, they immediately ran. Why? Because they knew that danger was around. And their, their senses were heightened. And they were aware of the danger that was there. Well, as Paul is writing to these beloved believers in Colossians, he says, there is a danger that I want you to be aware of, and it is this danger that someone is going to spoil you. Now, again, it's important for us to understand this word. The word spoil, as we have it in our culture, it, it has some different meanings that may come to mind, and so it's important for us to understand this. When you think of the word spoil, sometimes you might think of food that spoils. You know, go into the fridge, the milk's been in there too long, you start to pour yourself a nice glass to eat with your Oreo cookies, and there's clumps that come out, and you're like, nope, don't want to have that. That is spoiled milk. That's not the use of this word. Another use of this word is probably something that we've all run into either here at church or, or maybe you've run into this at a store, at a Walmart or something like that, where we think of someone who is a spoiled child, where there is this person who always gets what they want. And if they don't get what they want, what do they do? They throw a fit and they begin to get angry and upset and, and you know, they're the spoiled child. That's not the meaning of the word either. In order for us to understand this word spoiled that's used here, we have to understand the setting of the time. And the word spoiled here means this. It means to take captive, to become a prisoner or under the possession of another person who is the victor. Do you remember if you go back to the book of, of Joshua and as they are going into the promised land, they come to a city by the name of Jericho. And as they get to Jericho, there are no shots fired. All they do is they walk around the city as God described for them to do. And eventually they shouted and the walls fell down. And God told them this, when you go into the city, I don't want you to take any of the spoil for yourself. I don't want you to take any of the gold, the silver, the garments. I don't want you to take any of the people for yourself. Anything that you take out of that city, it needs to be put into the treasury of God. You know what he was telling them? Anything that you take captive. Anything that you take possession of, control over, that is the spoil that needs to be given to God. And what he's warning and cautioning these people about is this. He's saying, I want you to be aware that there is a legitimate threat out there for every one of us as believers that we could be taken captive, that we could become imprisoned, and we could be spiritually abducted. You know, this warning, as you consider it in the Scriptures, there are several things that the Scripture tells us that we need to be aware of. Some dangers that are out there and different ways that the Scripture tells us that we can become captive to, to the enemy. One of the ways is given to us all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 12. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 12, this is Moses speaking to the generation that is going to go into the promised land, not the generation that has died off and is still dying off in the wilderness, but, but they're getting ready to go into the promised land. He says this in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 12. He says, then beware. Beware of what? Well, the verse goes on and says this, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt. What is the concern that, that God has, and he relays this message through Moses, is that his own people would forget him. That his own people would forget what God has done for them. And astonishingly, we see that happening later on as they go into the promised land, as the generation that saw the works of God, saw the greatness of God, saw the power of God, as that generation dies off, we see the next generation forgetting the God who saved them, the God who delivered them. And sadly, 
I think it's safe for us to say that we're living in a culture today that has forgotten God. That there is a culture in our society today that says, I don't need God, that they push God out of their, out of their thinking, out of their lives, and they are forgetting God. And you'd say, oh, that would never happen to me. Be careful when you say that. Because many of us who are sitting in this room tonight, we can probably think of people who used to be sitting down the pew from us, maybe in front of us, maybe behind us, used to be serving and active in the church. Now they are no longer in the church. You know why? Because they fell into this danger and they forgot God. They forgot the rightful place that God deserved in their life. And so we need to be understanding of the fact that we are in danger of this threat as well. Not only that, but you continue to go on in Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 9. And again, he says, Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, and it be sin unto thee. He cautions them about this. He cautions them about the wickedness of our own heart. You know, Isaiah does that as well, doesn't he? Isaiah says this. He says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who could know it? Do you realize one of the greatest temptations, one of the greatest Areas where we would be tempted to become spiritually abducted is when we start to follow our own heart. When instead of following God's word and submitting to it, we start allowing ourselves to, to be controlled by our heart's desires. It's selfishness. It's sinfulness. And he says this in this passage of Scripture. He says, I want you to be aware of the wickedness of your own heart. We get into Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. Jesus Christ's words are this, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep clothes, but in uh, sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. We need to be very careful of false teachers. Now, most of us, again, we sit back and we think, I, I know what false teachers are. You know, I can identify false religions. I can identify those who are going against the Scripture. Do you realize that, that oftentimes the danger of being led away by a false teacher isn't by those who are just outright contradicting the Scripture. It's those who take the Scriptures, and it's those who manipulate them for their own benefit. It, it is those who, who use it to their own advantage, and they don't really care about the people. All they're worried about is themselves, their reputation, their financial standings, and boy, is that a danger that I have seen people falling prey to in our culture today? Somebody flashes a fancy smile and gives a nice, you know, polite message, and, and oftentimes it's not what we need to be on guard of is not what a person says, but oftentimes it's about what they are not willing to say. And there are a lot of people who are out there on the radio and on television who they are willing to tell people, scratching and itching their ears and, and telling people what they want to hear. But when it comes time to, to condemn sin and to call people out for sin, they're not willing to do it. That is a false teacher. And so we need to be aware of these false teachers. You go on in Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. Here's another danger that we can fall prey to, that we can be, uh, become... Someone who is covetous. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 15, Jesus Christ says, Beware of covetousness. Where we're discontent with what God is allowing to take place in our lives. Where we're discontent with what God is allowing us to endure in our lives. And so as a result, we become covetous of other people. Boy, I wish I had so-and-so's family life, or I wish I had so-and-so's maid, or I wish I had so-and-so's children, or so-and-so's parents, or I wish I had their possessions begin to get covetous. And all of these are things that the Scripture says that we need to beware of. One more that I'll give you. In fact, many of you probably know this verse, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. What's he saying? He's saying be aware. Why? Because we have an adversary, the devil, as a, ro as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. We have a real legitimate enemy known as the devil who is seeking to destroy us and take us captive. Satan would love to capture each one of us and to take us prisoner. Many of us would sit here tonight and say, not a big deal. I'm not in danger. I know the threat is there. May I give you the same caution that the Apostle Paul would write to the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. The reality is this, as Paul is writing to this church at Colossae, he's writing to encourage them, he's writing to instruct them, he's really going to be praising them for what they've done, but he says, I have this concern for you that even though you're doing well, be careful, you're standing in danger. So be aware of the threat. 
And oftentimes the threats do not come in often bold attacks all at once. Often Satan, our flesh, covetousness, false teachers, all of these things that we're told to be aware of, often they start with little things that are seemingly insignificant and we overlook as dangers in our lives. Growing up as a, as a young boy in Pennsylvania, I was the youngest of three boys, and uh, really I was the youngest boy in our church. I grew up in a, in a smaller church, and uh, I was the youngest of the boys that was there in the group. There were some younger girls that were in the church, but uh, that meant oftentimes I was someone who wasn't invited to do some things with the older guys. Well, as I got older, there was an opportunity where I was invited to go to a guy's house, and uh, we were, they actually had a cabin that was out in the woods, and we were going to get together, and we were just going to, you know, kind of hang out. His parents were going to be there. One of the things that we knew that we were going to do is we were going to play a game of capture the flag. And we didn't have paintball guns or anything like that, so we just decided, you know, we were going we to play some uh, capture the flag, and, and uh, you had to get tagged in order to be able to get, you know, to go to prison and stuff like that. But we decided we weren't just going to have one prison. We decided this. If you captured someone, you could, you could tie them to a tree. You could do, you know, whatever you needed to do to keep them from getting into your territory, discovering where the flag was, and uh, that's often what we did. In fact, we used Baylor's twine to be able to, to tie people to a tree. Now, remember, I told you I was the youngest. Some of you are like, that's like child cruelty. Wait until I'm done with the story. We, uh, we decided that, uh, you know, we, were, we would pick up teams, and so some of the older boys decided that they would begin to pick up, and as they were picking up, of course, I was the last one because I was the youngest. Nobody wanted short on their team. And so they picked up the teams. I was the last one to get picked. Both of them went to their sides. You know, we had already talked about the boundaries and where you could hide the flag and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we, we decided we would go and we'd give about five minutes for strategy discussion for each team. And so that's what we did. We started talking strategy. And as our team was talking strategy, I wasn't allowed to say anything. You know, I'm the youngest. I'm, you know, the littlest. Nobody wanted me on their team. I couldn't give any input whatsoever. Well, as I was standing there, about halfway through that five minutes, one guy just began to look at me. And he looked at me kind of strangely, and, and uh, I didn't really like him looking at me that way. And uh, he said, wait a minute. He said, here's what we need to do. This is going to be our strategy. We didn't really want Shorty on our team anyway, so the other team is just going to kind of overlook him. And so here's what I think we need to do. We need to send Shorty over into the enemy side. They're not going to capture him. They're not going to tie him up. They're not going to do anything to him. They're just going to overlook him. He can go over, find out where their flag is. He can come back and tell us so that we'll be able to go over and get their flag. I thought, great, this is going to be fun, you know? So I did. We started the game. I went over. I started looking around. I don't know if I ever got close to the flag or not, but after I was over there roaming around for a little while and walking around looking for things, the other team caught on to their strategy, and they realized when they saw no other boys from our team over there, I was the only one, they figured out what was happening. So they captured me. They tied me to a tree. And I was there the rest of the game. Nobody came to cut me loose or help me get out. I tried rubbing that baler's twine on the bark of the tree, you know, and everything to get off. And, and uh, anyway, long story short, our team ended up winning, thankfully. But, but you want to know what happened? As we were going into that competition, this side, our, our enemy, they viewed me as someone who was very insignificant. And if they would have continued to overlook me and I would have been able to find the flag, you want to know something? I could have gone back. I could have told our team we would have been able to come in and be able to defeat them very soundly. And you know, oftentimes that's the way that Satan works in your life and in my life. Satan comes in and he, he comes in with these little areas of our lives that we often overlook. We don't think that attitude is too bad. We don't think that language that we pick up out of movies or TVs, we don't, off of TV, we don't think that's too bad. We don't think that that music that we're listening to and the words that they're singing is, is that bad. And so we begin to incorporate it into our lives. And before we know it, Satan has gone from having just a little bit of influence in our life, and now he's taken up residence. And not only that, but because we continue to allow it in our lives, then Satan begins to build some strongholds in our lives that by the time we realize what has happened, now it's difficult to be able to remove that from our lives. You know why that is? Because oftentimes we overlook the threat of spiritual oppression. So the Apostle Paul, as he's writing here, he says, Colossians, I want you to be aware of this. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter your job. It doesn't matter your family situation. All of us need to be aware of 
there is a threat of spiritual abduction in our life. Let's move on, and we're going to see the second part of this uh, truth that he presents to them. He rewards them, first of all, about the threat of spiritual abduction. But second of all, there in verse 8, a little later, he begins to tell them the tactics of spiritual abduction. We have the threat. Be aware of this. Well, how are we going to be able to fight them? He says this. He says, I want you to know his tactics. So take a look again, if you would, here. God's Word shares with us some of the tactics of spiritual abduction that are used by the enemy. He says in verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through. And the very first thing that he begins to present to us is he presents to us that one of the ways that Satan is going to begin to take us and our flesh and covetousness and these things that he told us to be aware of, he says, is through philosophy and vain deceit. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the battle that takes place every day in our lives for the mind. Because whoever controls the way that we think is going to control the way that we live. Because in Proverbs, the Bible says this. It says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The Bible places a premium on us protecting our hearts. That's why in Proverbs chapter 4, he says, keep, guard, put a garrison about your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of life. Jesus Christ reminded the Pharisees and the Sadducees that, that it's not what we put into our body that defiles, but it's what comes out. He reminds us that our heart, our, it's, uh, what's in our heart is going to come out of our mouths through our tongue and the attitudes that are accompanied with it. All of that starts with the influence of who is going to control the way that we think. And so there is a philosophy that we have to be very careful of. In fact, if you consider Psalm chapter 1, as he is addressing the blessed man, do you realize he addresses this idea of the way that we think? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. You know where that downward progression begins? It begins by us allowing ourselves to become captivated and to become controlled by the wrong philosophy. And so one of the ways that we need to be aware of, one of the primary tactics that Satan is going to use to try and spoil or to take us captive is through these philosophies. Boy, there are predominant philosophies that are taking place in our culture today. And I'm not necessarily talking about political things, but I am talking about uh, areas in dealing with the value of human life and the involvement that God ought to have in our lives and our response to authority that God has placed in our lives. I think one of the gravest dangers, or one of the greatest dangers that we are reaping from generations before is when we took the Bible out of schools and out of people's lives, and as we remove that as an authority of our life, that's not the only authority that was removed, but now there are parents and there are teachers and there are policemen and there are people who God has put as authority figures in our lives, and you know why we don't respect them anymore? It's because we have thrown out the ultimate authority. We have thrown God and God's Word out of our lives. And listen, you and I have to be very careful. I am preaching to myself at this point as much as I am to you. We need to be very careful that we are willing to take God's Word for what it says and we allow God's Word to be the authority in our lives. It doesn't matter if the popular opinion on radio, television, or the Internet deny, uh, it agrees with God's Word or not. We need to be willing to stand on the truths of God's Word. And as Paul is writing to these believers, he says, listen, one of the greatest ways that we can become captivated and we can become spoiled, that we can become spiritually abducted, is when we don't guard the way that we think. When we stop thinking according to God's word, we open ourselves up to become easy prey to spiritual abduction. He goes on and he says, not only is there the possibility of the tactic of philosophy and vain deceit, but he goes on and he says this, he says, after the tradition of men. All of us know what traditions are, don't we? We come upon holidays, things like Labor Day, things like Fourth of July, things like Christmas, and we have... Traditions. Now, he's not talking about traditions in that manner, but he is talking about traditions uh, as you consider this. He, he's not talking about traditions and celebrating those holidays necessary, excuse me, necessarily, uh, but he is talking about traditions that would go in opposition to the truth of God's Word. In other words, if there is any sort of teaching, if there is any sort of principle or command that is a tradition of man, but it goes contrary to the Bible, then you and I need to dismiss that tradition and not allow it to capture us. 
boy, they are religious organizations. They are political organizations. They are even family uh, situations where people have allowed tradition to be something that has caused them to become spoiled by the enemy. And they have become spiritually abducted. We need to make sure that we allow God's viewpoint to be that which reigns supreme in our lives and in our minds. Notice the third tactic that he mentions. He says, first of all, the philosophy and vain deceit. Second of all, the tradition of men. Third, the rudiments of this world. Now, I know it seems like a vocabulary uh, class tonight a little bit, giving you these words and explaining them, but most of us don't use the word rudiments a lot anymore. Uh, we, we probably look at that and we think we have an understanding of it, but, but it's, we need to make sure that we're clear on it. The idea of that word rudiments means the basic elements or the elementary teachings and thinkings of a culture. It's a reference to the beginning of something, and then there's the start of a series after that. For instance, today, if we want to know that a child knows his alphabet, we don't walk up to him and say, do you know your, we might ask him if they know their alphabet, and if they don't understand that word, we don't look at them and say, do you know the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, and go through all of the alphabet, do we? We ask them what? Do you know your A, B, Cs? That's the, the basic. You start there, teaching them those letters. But what happens when they begin to understand letters and sounds? Then they're able to make those letters into words. Then they're able to take those words and they're able to form sentences. And then those sentences are able to form paragraphs, and those paragraphs are able to form, and you see how that just begins and continues to build, but it all starts with the rudiments, the basic elements that we call the alphabet. And as he's writing to these believers, he says, you want to know something? You need to be very careful. There are these rudiments, there are these basic elements of dealing with other people, of dealing with the world, of submitting to God, you need to be very careful that you are not allowing yourself to become spiritually abducted by following after the rudiments, the basic elements of this world. Following after feelings. Following after, oh, it just seems to work, and so I guess it's the right thing to do. Making sure that the Internet or magazines or popular opinion determine what is right. We've gotten away from the truths of God's Word, and we are being spoiled, taken captive by the elementary teachings of this world. Whether it is a country, whether it is communities, whether it is churches, whether it is families or individuals, all of us need to be aware of the danger, the threat of being under spiritual abduction, but we also need to recognize the tactics. The tactics of the enemy are very deceitful. They are very deceptive. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, there is this passage of Scripture where the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he says this, but I fear. And many of you in here, you are parents. If you're not a parent, you have someone in your life that you love, that you maybe look out for. You don't want to see them put in danger, and you know that fear. You have a little bit of this, this fear, this hesitancy. And he says this, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through the subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. What is he telling the Corinthians? He's saying he's very subtle. His tactics are not something he's going to come and be in your face oftentimes. He's very subtle. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1, the church at Galatia started out doing well. But he says this in chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Who hath deceived you? And there's not a one of us in this room tonight who are in danger of that not happening in our life. Where we can become bewitched, where we can become deceived through these tactics. In 2 John verses 7 through 9, he says, For many deceivers are entered into the world. By the way, notice that word many. There are many deceivers that are in, enter into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Uh-oh, beware. We come across anyone, false teacher, friend, foe, whoever it may be, if they are not willing to identify Jesus Christ as God come in the flesh, we need to beware. He says this, he says, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves. In other words, beware that you lose not those things which we have wrought but that we receive a full reward. 
all throughout the scriptures, the ministry of Jesus Christ, the ministry of the disciples and the apostles as, as God gives it to us in the New Testament. He's encouraging, reminding the churches, beware, here are the tactics. You know, Satan is very skilled in what I call sowing and strengthening seed thoughts. Now, this is going to be something that you're going to look at me and you're going to say, preacher, that's dumb, okay? But here's the thought that I had when I was thinking. Have you ever noticed that seeds are always smaller than the fruit that they produce? I know. You're like, duh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I don't really know of, and there may be someone, something out there, but seeds always are smaller than the fruit that they produce. So what do we do? We take those seeds, we put them in the ground, and we allow them to grow into plants. And then those plants begin to what? They begin to bear fruit. And if you have a garden, you know how that if there is some reason why you've had to neglect it and you get even weeds and things there in the garden, you know the longer that they grow, the harder they are to get out because those roots begin to get deep into our into the ground. The same thing happens spiritually in our lives. You see, we don't want the fruit oftentimes of the sin, the seed sin that Satan puts into our lives. I can tell you looking back in my life, boy, there are times where I wish I would have been a whole lot smarter, a whole lot more alert to the seed that say I let Satan sow in my life. You know why? Because when it finally came to fruition, the fruit was born, boy, it was devastating. And we have to be careful, dads. We have to be careful in our home, that we are not allowing seeds to be planted in the lives of our children. And yes, I put that responsibility on you and me as dads because we are the ones who God put in the home to be the leaders. Now, moms, I'm not saying you are exempt from that because he tells us that parents are to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I think it needs to be a group thing that's there. But we need to be very careful of the seed thoughts that we are allowing to be implanted into our own lives and into the lives of our spouses and into the lives of our children. Because those seeds that are implanted through those television shows, through those movies, through those friendships that they have, through those areas that we let slide in our own lives, all of those are going to produce, if we're not very careful and we don't keep rooting those things out and tearing those weeds out of our lives, they're going to bear a plant and that plant is going to produce fruit. And Satan loves to plant small seed sins into our lives that we tend to overlook. And how does he do that? He does it by getting into our thoughts, by accepting things, tradition. It's the way that we've always done it. Well, if we've always done it that way, but we find out that it's in contradiction to God's Word, God's Word ought to always win. And Satan is an excellent tactician. In fact, he was even so arrogant, he tried to come and use these tactics on Jesus Christ. And you know what Jesus Christ used to be able to defeat the devil? He didn't use the Internet. He didn't use his feelings. He didn't use popular opinion. He used the Word of God. And it is imperative that we recognize the tactics that Satan loves to use. Why? Well, let me share with you the last truth that we're going to look at tonight. We see the threat of spiritual abduction. We see the tactics that are used. But finally tonight, I want us to recognize this. I want us to notice the triumph over spiritual abduction. You see, he's not just throwing this out there as a possibility. As, as someone who is writing to them and cares deeply for them, he says this. He says, I want to give you how you can triumph over this. How can we be victorious? Notice the very last part of verse 8. We haven't shared this part yet, but he says this, and not after Christ. And then if you were to read down through verses 9 through 12, maybe you noticed that I was emphasizing some key words in there. You will see the phrases, in him, in whom, with him, multiple times in that passage of Scripture. You want to know how we triumph over spiritual abduction? It is this, that you and I have a passionate pursuit of Christ. Notice verse 8. He says the tactic is this, that he is going to try and spoil us through the use of philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of this men, uh, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world. But notice this, he says, and not after Christ. In other words, anything that comes into our lives, anything 
that distracts us from, that deludes, deceives, and destroys the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Those are things that we cannot allow to have in our lives. You know why? Because if we do, we aren't going to triumph over spiritual abduction. The point is this. It is that you and I must actively be pursuing, protecting, and growing in our relationship with God. In using this phrase here in the scriptures, he's giving to us the means by which we defend ourselves, pursue Christ, have a passion for Christ, pursue his person, get to know him better, work at it, get to know the will of God, the word of God, the ways of God. That's the strategy for victory. Why? Because anything that does not point to, exalt, give the right opinion of, or glorify God is a fraud can be used very easily to take us captive. Listen to these admonitions of Scripture. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 11, David is writing a song of praise, and he says this, Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face continually. In other words, we can't just do it when we're at church. We can't just do it in our devotional time where we read the Scriptures and we mark it off and we say, okay, I had my devotional time, now I can go do what I want to do. No, no, we have to seek God continually. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22 and verse 19, David is giving a charge to Solomon, his son. David is about to pass off the scene. Solomon is now becoming king. And here's what he tells his son. He says, now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. What was David's concern? David's concern was my son Solomon is going to be led astray. He is going to be spiritually abducted. And I don't want that to happen to him. And so Solomon, my advice to you is this. Set your heart and your soul to seek after God. In Psalm 27 and verse 8, he says, When thou said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Psalm 63, verse 1, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul, notice these words of passion, my soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and weary land where no water is. As you continue to go on, you get to places like Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, where he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In John chapter 15, after the Lord's Supper in the upper room, Jesus and his disciples, they begin to make their way down to the Garden of Gethsemane. And you know what he does? He takes an illustration of a vine, something very simple something that they would have been in contact with and something that they would have never even thought of as an illustration. But he says, you see how that branch is connected to, that, the, the root, or to, the, uh, to the vine? If you were to take that branch and you were to snap it off, just like that branch is not going to be able to bear fruit except it abides, it stays close to, it stays connected to the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. What is Jesus Christ cautioning his disciples about? Guys, don't let there become something that's going to come into your life that's going to cause a wedge to come between you and me. Stay passionate about your relationship with me. You go on in James chapter 4 and verse 8, and he says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. In writing to the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, here's the testimony of that church, a church that was once doing well, that was once on, we might say this, was on fire for God. But in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, here's the testimony that he gives of that Ephesian church. He says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. What happened? What happened to the church at Ephesus? It's the same thing, the same danger that you and I face in our lives today. We stop pursuing. We stop having a passion. We stop having this desire to be close to God. And there is distance that is created, and before you know it, we've left our first love. How is your passionate pursuit of Jesus Christ tonight? In each of these verses, we see God giving an admonition to seek, pursue, follow after Christ with a passion. Triumph over spiritual abduction is dependent on our passionate pursuit of Christ. May 23rd, 1934 was an important day in the life of two men. One man, his name was Frank Hammer. The other man's name was Manny Galt. After several months of being gone from their families, these two men had reached their goal. Let me tell you the story that took place. In early 1934, there was a prison break at Eastham Prison Facility in Texas. During the prison break, there was a guard that was shot there was, and died. There were several others that were wounded. 
five convicts had escaped during this, uh, during this breakout. Since that time, Frank Hammer became obsessed with tracking down the duo responsible for this prison break and the death of that prison guard. He would spend hours researching, studying, analyzing the history, the family, the background, their stomping grounds in, in search of any clues that he might find to be able to acquire and capture these criminals. After several weeks of intense investigation, he finally found the clue he was looking for. One man who was fearful for his family's safety agreed to help Hammer and his partner with the capture of this criminal duo. Knowing the duo was planning a visit to their home stomping grounds, Hammer instructed the man to park his truck on the road and pretend he was changing a flat tire. Around 9.15 in the morning on May 23, 1934, the criminal duo came roaring down the road in their Ford V8 coupe. Recognizing the truck that was pulled off on the side of the road ahead where this man was pretending to change his flat tire, as they got closer, they slowed down and they came to a stop to help. Hammer had hoped to take the criminals alive, but there was some confusion in the mind of one of the deputies that day. Seeing the criminal duo reaching for something in the car, one of the deputies began to fire the, or be, fired the first shot of what would be an onslaught of bullets into that car. Later, investigators say the deputies finally ceased fire after hurling 167 bullets and buckshot at the car into, that, into the criminals inside. Some of you may already know the names of the criminal duo that I'm talking about that day. Their names were the infamous Bonnie and Clyde. These two people were people who had performed crimes of robbery, murder, breaking themselves and others out of prison, and other crimes that they came face to face with that day when they met Frank Hammer, his friend, and those other deputies. There were others who wanted to stop Bonnie and Clyde, but they failed. You know why? Because for them, it had just become a job. For them, it had just become what they thought might be a, a duty. But for Frank Hammer and his friend Manny, it wasn't a job. It wasn't a duty. It was an obsession. They had a passion to stop this criminal duo, and they were going to search and follow them all over the country until they were either captured or killed. Now listen, I'm not here to justify those events and the number of bullets that were thrown into that car that day. I'm not here to justify even some of the tactics that they used in order to be able to find out some of the information. But what I am here to tell you is this. People are always passionate about something. And if you and I are going to be people who are going to remove ourselves from well, putting ourselves in danger of spiritual abduction, we need to have a passion for Jesus Christ. How persistent, how passionate are you in your pursuit of Christ? Anything. Any Christian that stops pursuing Christ and loses his passion is opening himself up to being defeated by the enemy and taken captive, spiritually abducted by Satan. Therefore, you and I must be proactive. We must be vigilant in our pursuit of Christ. We need to maintain regular time in God's Word. We need to maintain regular communication with Him in prayer. We need to be maintaining regular times of fellowship and encouragement and praying for one another and with one another as believers. Why? Because if we don't, the flame begins to flicker. And before you know it, that passion has died away. What are you doing right now to strengthen your passion and your pursuit of God? We're going to be removing ourselves out from underneath this danger of spiritual abduction. And we're going to be able to claim the triumph over spiritual abduction. And it requires that we are in pursuit of Jesus Christ. I started off this message by telling you about the, the milk carton campaign that started in the 1980s. Boy, technology has come a long way since then, hasn't it? We've gone from things like milk cartons to putting things on the Internet. Now there are these things that we have called Amber Alerts, where it identifies the vehicle, the license plate, maybe even gives a little bit of the description of the child or the person who has been abducted. The purpose of that is that they want to get the word out quickly. They want to try and get that person brought back home soon and safely. Maybe you're here tonight and you're already going through some of the tactics. You're facing some of the tactics of spiritual abduction. You've lost that pursuit and that passion for Christ. Maybe tonight this is God's way of saying, I want you to come back home safe and soon. Why not do it tonight? Why not let God return you to the place that you need to be 
why don't we ask God tonight, God, renew that passionate pursuit in our life for you because I want to have this triumph over spiritual aggression. Maybe tonight there's someone here who you know someone who has already become a captive to spiritual abduction. May I encourage you tonight that maybe in your mind's eye, maybe even on some sort of a device, maybe on the old-fashioned piece of paper and using a pencil, you need to write their name down and you need to ask God for the wisdom to be able to know how to present them with the truth so that they can come back home to God safe and sound and soon. No longer captivated by the things of this world, no longer spiritually abducted, but instead they've come home to their Heavenly Father. My hope is that none of us here tonight would have to face any sort of physical abduction. But also my prayer is this, that as we face the temptation, the threat, all of us will face it. As we face that threat, that we will passionately pursue Christ and we will be able to be triumphant over spirit.